Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Taryn Lloyd, and this is a rapid review of episode 65, IV Iron for Anemia in the Emergency Department. I think that this topic is super important because for years we've been transfusing red blood cells in the eMERGE to patients who don't actually need them. A study looking at trends in transfusion practice found that about one third of transfusions were totally inappropriate. Because of this, this rapid review will cover two things. One, who to consider giving IV iron to, and two, when and how to give it. First and foremost, consider giving IV iron instead of packed red blood cells in your iron deficient anemia patients. Iron deficiency is defined as a hemoglobin less than 120 in females or 130 in males. This plus an MCV of 75 or less when it's previously been normal or a ferritin of less than 30. Please keep in mind that a previously normal MCV is important because it rules out the alternative diagnosis of thalassemia. Okay. Let's dive into more specific situations in which you might consider giving IV iron. The first situation in which you might consider giving the IV iron instead of a blood transfusion, or really a blood transplant, is in a young, healthy patient with anemia. As an example, let's consider a young female patient that may be presenting with menorrhagia. First, screen your patient for hemodynamic instability and the severity of their ongoing blood loss. Any of these items on the screen may mean that they do require a red cell transfusion. Screen your patients for chest pain, shortness of breath, presyncope or syncope, hypotension, and tachycardia. Importantly, fatigue, pallor, and reduced exercise tolerance alone are not triggers for packed red blood cell transfusion. However, don't forget to treat their menorrhagia or blood loss also. In the example of a young female woman that is presenting with iron deficiency anemia, remember that IV iron is important in these patients if they are stable because they are often chronically anemic and they have compensated physiologically. Secondary, it is better for them than a red cell transfusion. These patients are at risk of alloimmunization on top of all the other risks of blood transfusions. Think of a transfusion as a blood transplant you are changing that patient's immune system for life, and this will affect their future blood matchability when they really might need it. Okay, the second specific population that you should consider giving IV iron to instead of a packed red blood cell transfusion is in the elderly anemic patient. In fact, most of the patients in the eMERGE found to be anemic are elderly. These patients generally fall into one of three categories. One third will have a simple nutritional deficiency, either iron or B12. One third will have anemia secondary to a chronic disease. The rest of the patients will have an undifferentiated cause of their anemia that will require further investigations. For an elderly patient with multiple comorbidities, it can be challenging to determine if their anemia is secondary to iron deficiency as well as anemia of chronic disease. To help you differentiate and decide whether a patient may benefit from IV iron and further supplementation, our experts have suggested the following approach. First, check a ferritin level. If the ferritin is less than 30, you have your diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. However, if it is over 30, you should go on to order a transferrin saturation level. If the transferrin is less than 20%, you are also probably dealing with iron deficiency anemia and the patient may benefit from IV iron and further supplementation. Okay, let's move on to our second objective of when and how to give IV iron. First, let's start with when to give IV iron and when to do away with the IV and give PO iron because we already know when we're giving iron instead of a red cell transfusion. Give the iron IV instead of PO if oral iron has been poorly tolerated, if you know that the patient will have poor oral absorption such as in gastric bypass, celiac disease, or gastritis, if the rate of bleeding is too brisk, 
If the patient has a severe anemia with a hemoglobin less than 90, especially if they're having ongoing bleeding, or if it's a time-sensitive situation, such as the patient is going for an OR. Don't give iron IV if there's any concern for active systemic infection, such as in sepsis. Also, this is a given, but if the patient has had a previous allergic or hypotensive reaction, don't give the IV iron again. That brings me to my risks. The risks of giving IV iron are hypotension at a rate of 1 to 2%, and 2, a risk of serious allergic reaction, which is about less than 1 in a million. Other more common adverse reactions include joint aches, muscle cramps, headache, chest discomfort, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. However, these generally resolve spontaneously within 24 hours of administration of IV iron. Please remember to counsel your patients accordingly. Okay, now for the fun part. How do we actually give the IV iron? Well, the first step is to select the product that you are going to use. Depending on where you work, you will either have access to Venifer, which is iron sucrose, or Farahim. Most likely, if you are listening to this review in Canada, you only have access to Venifer, since Farahim is no longer available here. However, just to quickly review the difference between the two products. Primarily, iron sucrose or Venifer has to be infused over two hours, where Farahim could be given much faster in 15 to 60 minutes. With mainly only having access to Venifer in Canada, the decision for us up here is pretty simple. However, I will point out a few benefits of Venifer also. With Venifer, you don't have to worry about whether or not the patient will have an MRI within the next three months, as you do with Farahim. Also, pregnant and breastfeeding women should always receive Venifer instead of Farahim. Also, the longer infusion time of Venifer may not be such a problem when you consider the large population that requires a larger transfusion time anyways. Primarily, patients over the age of 65, any patients on beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, three or more antihypertensives, asthma patients, eczema patients, or patients with severe respiratory or cardiac disease, these patients should all have a slower infusion time anyway, making the decision between Venafer and Farahim more simple. When in doubt, go with Venafer, especially if it's the only one you have access to. All right, you've given your iron infusion, the patient's happy, you didn't give them a blood transplant, you're happy because the infusion time was less than it takes to match the blood and give the blood products, and now it's time to discharge the patient. After IV iron supplementation, you should prescribe and counsel around oral iron supplementation. Prescribe ferrous sulfate, 300 milligrams of one tab QHS. This contains 60 milligrams of elemental iron. Counsel the patient to take it at bedtime on an empty stomach at least two hours after meals and to take it with vitamin C, 500 milligrams. Counsel the patient to avoid taking it with calcium or magnesium supplements as both of these decrease absorption. Next shift, avoid the blood transplants for your iron deficient anemia patients, especially in young healthy patients and in the elderly. Consider giving them IV iron instead, specifically in Canada, Venifer. For examples of IV iron order sets and patient information handouts, please visit emergencymedicinecases.com where you can also learn more and find our full references. See you next time.